Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone across the time zones. Thank you very much for joining us today. Maritime M&A is on the rise. Whether we're talking about acquiring tonnage or tech, financing entities or fleet hold codes, the use of corporate M&A in the maritime industry is increasingly being used as a way for buyers to achieve growth and consolidation and sellers to obtain returns and liquidity. That's not to say that the days of the MOA are numbered, just to say that industry players will increasingly need to be alive to the risks and rewards of a more traditional M&A structure being used in some maritime transactions. My name is Dan Saunders, and I'm a partner in the corporate and maritime teams of Watson, Farley and Williams, and I'm joined today by my colleagues, Christina Howard and Mark Took, as well as a panel of industry experts to discuss trends and issues in maritime M&A. And I have the pleasure of introducing that panel now. First up, we have Johan Minaya, who is a Managing Director at international financial advisory firm Evercore. Since joining Evercore, Johan has helped to develop a global industry-leading transportation and infrastructure investment banking franchise, and is primarily focused on the shipping and aviation verticals. Name any large shipping restructuring in the last 10 years, and you'll likely see Johan's name on the email circulation list. Johan, welcome. How's everything going in New York? Thanks, Dan. It's a pleasure to have you. Just like you said, m and is back, uh, New York City is back, as I see uh, the traffic light um, bustling over here. Fantastic. Good to hear. Next, hopping back across the Atlantic to the UK, we're joined by Ryan Biscom, a director at BDO UK. Specialising in maritime strategic advisory and financial due diligence, Ryan's role sees him take the lead with a wide range of clients, whether that's financial institutions, private equity, quoted companies, private companies or investors. BDO have a team that has the strength and depth to handle deals of all sizes. Ryan, thanks for joining us today. I understand you've escaped London and are up in Manchester today. Yes, that's right, Dan. Th thank you very much for inviting me to present today. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, and finally, back across the pond again to New York. Uh, you can tell I am missing international travel. I'm delighted to introduce Ben Grenier of SSY Finance. Now, most people know Simpson Spence Young as a trusted independent shipbroker, but since 2019, SSY has also been providing experienced and dedicated financial advice on various shipping, intermodal, and logistics transactions all over the world. Ben himself has over 18 years of corporate finance and M&A experience, including previously have been, having been a senior vice president in the shipping corporate finance team at DVB Capital Markets LLC. Uh, ben, how's it going? Fantastic. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, good to see that uh, at least someone has a sense of decorum. I've just given up all ties, uh, but you do. I do like your one. <laughs> right. Great. Right. Our uh, guest speakers will be joined by myself and my partners, Mark Took and Christina Howard, who are each part of WFW's international corporate and maritime teams. We each regularly advise on all types of maritime M&A transactions, and hopefully most of our audience is familiar with WFW, but for those that are not, WFW has the largest dedicated maritime practice of any law firm in the world, comprising of over 200 international maritime specialists, over 13 jurisdictions and 17 offices. Indeed, we're very happy to announce two new arrivals to the family and that we've recently opened offices in Dusseldorf and in Sydney. WFW has built its brand on its shipping finance practice, but perhaps our best kept secret is our capability and reach as a full service maritime firm including being market leading advisors in maritime M&A, joint ventures, competition advice, and commercial contracts. We've found that having dedicated corporate maritime partners such as Christina, Mark, and myself, allows us to provide a service that offers not only legal support, but the tactical and commercial support that only comes from advisors that truly know and understand the sector in which they're operating. This of course extends to the advisors that we love to work with. And I'm very happy to say that Evercore BDO and SSY all fall, fall squarely within that camp. Of course, the next hour would be extremely awkward if we didn't think that that was the case. So just a bit of, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, Please note that uh, the participant or the uh, audience video and audio have been disabled to minimize interruptions uh, and that this webinar will be recorded. Uh, we very much welcome any questions you might have, but we want to make sure that we have an opportunity to provide considered answers. So if you have any questions for any of us, please feel free to email them into events at wfw.com. That's events with an S at wfw.com. And we'll be happy to arrange for whomever the question is directed at to provide a response. So hopefully the intro has convinced you that we are all worth you giving us your next 45 minutes of time. Let's get on with discussing the topic of the day, maritime M&A. 
So, Johan, I'm going to pick on you first. I think we can all agree that M&A activity in the maritime sector, let alone sale of tonnage, has increased through Q4 2020, Q1 2021. And it continues to be on rise on the rise in this quarter. So the question is, what factors do you think have contributed to this? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, look, I think we first need to understand the macroeconomic backdrop that we're in today, which is very, very strong. We're basically in a synchronized global economic recovery. Consumer demand is back. Vaccine distributions are going well. Massive stimulus and fiscal support and commodity prices are increasing. So that means that that's trickling down to the shipping landscape. When you couple that with an order book that we haven't seen as low in more than 20 or even 25 years, that creates very strong fundamentals, which is why, for example, in the liner segment, that's having its best year ever in, in let's say, more than 15 years, and their um, their earnings capacities are very strong, even in the dry bulk side of things. You know, it's 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 nice to see even a handy size ship yesterday was, um, I think, a fixture got quoted in north of $25,000 a day. So with that very strong outlook in the shipping landscape, that means valuations have gone up. Um, significantly, if you look at just the public markets, um, market capitalizations have doubled or even times for certain companies increased five times. Valuations are trading at or, or above um, net asset values. And with a very good balance sheet, that means a lot of the factors are aligned for making an, the m and environment very, very conducive, which is why it's not just shipping. It's, it's a lot of other sectors, but we're seeing it in shipping very, very strong this quarter. Excellent. Uh, Mark, what, what, what's your view? I mean, any other uh, factors that are pushing this increase in activity that you'll see? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dan. I mean, to add to, to what Johan um, has, has said, I mean, from our side, I think we're seeing a number of factors that are driving some of the transactions that are coming our way. I mean, consolidation is once again a hot topic. Maybe it always was, um, but clearly consolidation through corporate M&A can offer quite a straightforward way for businesses to scale up rapidly and add tonnage and, and business rather quickly. Um, but it, it, I think the drivers go further than that. Using a corporate M&A style transaction rather than buying the assets via MOA can assist with capturing the value in a business other than just the tonnage. So if there's value in the brand or the, there's value in relationships, personnel and experience, or perhaps the financing relationships, those are much more amenable to, to be bought and sold via a corporate M&A process rather than simply buying, buying vessels. Um, I think Johan mentioned um, listed company valuations and, and share prices. Uh, I mean, corporate M&A transactions can offer good liquidity um, to the to the seller where the listed company is a buyer and it's using its shares as consideration. And we're seeing some of those deals come through. Um, I guess another element is practical um, in that a corporate M&A transaction uh, can avoid some of the complexities that you have during completion of a large scale fleet uh, sale and purchase. Those can sometimes be problematic to manage. Uh, for example, ensuring that vessels are in the right place to ensure a tax efficient transfer and also avoiding issues that can arise around completion where vessels are mid voyage. So, you know, insurances, issues with, with, uh, with live charters. And if you structure your acquisition or sale as a corporate M&A transaction, a lot of those issues can be sidestepped or avoided, avoided completely. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That, that tax point is something that we've looked at a lot, isn't it? It's something that ship owners often kind of ignore when they're buying the steel, but can actually have a really strong effect. And as you say, the, the, the buying the, the company can really minimise that risk, which sometimes the industry doesn't take as seriously as perhaps they should. Yeah, and it certainly can be a nasty surprise, um, you know, a cold sweat moment where you're suddenly looking at the location of individual vessels when they've been involved in, a, in an individual sale and purchase, just to make sure that they haven't strayed within the, the jurisdiction of a tax inefficient, uh, tax, tax inefficient place to buy and sell a vessel. Uh, and, and yeah, as we say, you know, that, that can be avoided with a, with a corporate sale. Um, I guess one of the things that sometimes puts people off structuring their deal as a corporate M&A transaction 
is the fact that you acquire the historical corporate liabilities as well as the benefits in the companies. Um, but actually that's a bit of a, 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 a either a double-edged sword or there are benefits to, the, to go with the disadvantages because there is a greater ability to seek protection through extensive due diligence and warranties in a corporate sale than is customary um, with, a, with, a, with the sale of a, uh, an individual vessel under an MOA. So although there are potentially greater risks that you're acquiring, there is a much greater opportunity to investigate those risks or, or lay them off. Um, I guess it's worth, worth saying that one thing that we've noticed you know, in, in, in the very recent past as a trend, and we expect this to be an increasing trend, is uh, interest in strategic acquisitions of tech companies in the shipping space or stakes in tech, tech owning companies. Um, and I think that's been driven partly by uh, enabling the, the ship owners, the ship operators uh, to have early and priority access to cutting edge technologies. And those are definitely seen as uh, an essential element of meeting ESG and climate change targets. Um, and also sort of a, a, an allied point that does offer an opportunity to shipping, shipping companies to capture some of the value that is created by their participation in that tech R&D process. Um, so for example, where they're providing vessels for prototypes and demonstrators, um, or indeed just being major customers of a new technology, um, that value to the shipping company can largely be lost, but it can be clawed back to some extent by the shipping company taking a stake in the tech company. Okay, so um, we're seeing M and A more than more than just in the in the steel itself. There is there is advantages through M and A through R and D and 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 maybe even joint venturing in order to obtain a kind of scale to to try out new technology and develop new technology. Absolutely, and just one one final point really, which I think has been um, you know it's always been a driver of some M and A activity in in the shipping sector, but we're seeing more of that over the last uh, last two or three years, and that's divestment of non core businesses uh, and assets by larger shipping companies that are really focusing their on their core revenue generating activities and disposing very good profit making businesses, but ones that aren't core to to their their review the renewed mission statement. Um, you know, whether it's by geography, by vessel size or by cargo type, but we are seeing those sorts of strategic divestments and there, there are you know some some good opportunities in, in the market um, for 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 new entrants. Excellent. Uh, now, Ryan, uh, Johan touched on the position with with container lines being being quite doing quite well at the moment. Um, are there other sectors? I mean, do you agree? Do you agree that the, the container uh, segment is uh, is right for this type of activity? Are, are there other sectors that you see as promising? Yes, I uh, do, Dan. Yes. Yeah. So obviously, the container side um, is doing remarkably well at the moment. Um, and it gets the most media attention. So there's a general trickle down of, of positive sentiment across the market from the major container players. Uh, you know, whilst there's no major mergers and acquisitions of the container players at the moment in the past 12 months, you know, they are still active. They're making investments into infrastructure and that's in sort of terminal investments. Um, but they're also active in terms of investing into onshore uh, logistics operations and um, acquisition targets which have data and technology as a, as a key focus you know, as, as they look to integrate more deeply into the supply chain. Um, a, good, a good example of this is Maersk where you, you know, we've seen them acquire Performance LLC, a US logist, online logistics business, uh, and also KGH Custom Services. Uh, they were acquired the past 12 months. So they're looking to really uh, extract as much value as possible out of that supply chain through technology, um, which, is, which is really quite interesting. Um, and I think that's going to that's going to continue as all, all the major lines are going to push in that direction to integrate more widely into your supply chain. Um, you know, it's interesting to note Maersk itself has established its own venture capital arm uh, that does you know relatively small scale you know one to five million pound uh, transactions, but they're 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 buying onshore businesses. They're buying people that uh, maximize data. Um, so yeah, my recent, my recent their most recent acquisition was a company called Torch PLC, which is an on, onshore uh, 3PL business. Um, so yeah, I think container lines um, they're going to drive activity. I suppose other subsectors. You've got the chemical 
Uh, the chemical tanker sector, there's been a bit of activity there over the past 12 months. You've had the Dupoli, the Italian entity merging with uh, Team Tankers fleet. You've had the UACC transaction, which I'm sure your team is very familiar with. Um, but there are different drivers, I think, to those, those transactions. And I think some of those are probably focused around um, some of the refinancing needs of some of the business uh, and the needs to sort of uh, you know, restructure these businesses going forward um, to make them sustainable. Uh, and then as I find, we just touch on maybe the tanker market, which is not having a particularly great time at the moment, but there's still transactions taking place. You've got the recent international seaways and uh, diamond S shipping uh, merger. Uh, and, and then the pools themselves, the tanker pools, they're, they're, they're continuing to expand and grow. Um, you know, people like Tankers International continuing to grow their fleet. Um, they've One of their pool partners is, is Euronav, and they managed to generate a couple of years, years ago. So yeah, they're, they're, they're really pushing on and seem to be having some success um, because you need the scale in that sector. You really need the scale to be able to, to deal with the oil majors and the national oil companies. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Ryan. So with this increase of activity, um, you know, what type of trends are we starting to see emerge? I mean, certainly I've been kept busy over the last little while with, with what we kind of uh, briefly call ships for shares deals, which, which Johan touched on a little earlier, basically where, where the uh, listed shares are used as consideration for the acquisition of, of, of larger fleets. And obviously the, the, the seemingly the king of that has been Starbuck, um, really driving consolidation in the bulkers market. But we've also seen other, other you know, entities make use of, uh, of, of their share capital as consideration. Torm recently, Bell Ships, uh, although that wasn't a fleet sale, Bell Ships purchase was for one vessel, but, but it still seems to be a trend in the market now that the, the trading prices has, has improved to, to help such deals, that these ships for, ships for shares deals are, um, are, are becoming more common. Johan, do you agree with that, with that sentiment? You know, absolutely, Dan. You hit, a, you hit on all the right points. Um, it's a trend that we've seen, frankly, for the last two to three years. Um, it, it's incredibly hard in shipping to still access the public markets if you want to have monetization. Um, so when you have, and shipping is still, as we all know, a very fragmented um, sector. So if you may have a private equity shop or another owner who may own a fleet of, of 10 or 15 assets, that IPO market is, is still not there. Luckily, we saw Zim go public, which was obviously very, very successful. But that was the first access to the U.S. capital markets, I believe, since 2015. So what's the next logical trend to in, um, enhance your pathway to monetization or to liquidity? It's the ship for shares um, transactions. And that's that's a transaction between a private and a public entity. So of course, when the, the stock currency is is well valued like it is today at or above NAV, then that makes it very um, conducive to um, to discuss some um, pricing where you can even at times play a, a modest um, premium for, for those um, for those ships in exchange for for the shares and of course trading liquidity traded liquidity um, matters shipping um, has always had unfortunately a very low um, trading liquidity but where, where valuations are today you have companies like uh, Denals with a 30 million dollar average trading liquidity or or star bulk at, at 20 or more that makes it a lot feasible and enhances someone's motivation to exchange their sh ships for shares, and then they can count and trust that they can access um, the the public markets in you know in a dribbled way over the next two to three months. And therefore, it perhaps is no surprise that a lot of the sellers we're seeing are private equity backed, uh, you know, entities or joint ventures with private equity involved, so they can take the benefit of that liquidity and, and try and drive you know very short lock in periods so that they have that optionality whereas they didn't uh, previously. Um, and Ben, perhaps another trending area that I know you and I have spoken about and, and Mark touched on a little bit earlier is investment in technology. And I know it's, it's a bit of an area for you. Perhaps you can tell us a bit about your experience in, in, in that area and that trending area. Look, definitely. It's, uh, and yes, we have spoken about it and, and Mark definitely touched on some of the key points there. The term technology is very broad, right? And shipping has certainly had a steady stream of innovation arrive over the years, but uh, it's, it's clear to everyone that there are certain factors more present now 
driving uh, exploration in technology than uh, there has been in the recent past. And I think when we, when for the purposes of audiences here, when we're talking about technology, uh, I, I believe we're really focused more on the, the innovations that are potentially highly disruptive to the industry as a whole that may not have been proven out. You know, we're looking at things like propulsion systems, et cetera, data analytics, communications, but there, there was a, a broad universe of technological innovations that are arriving in shipping. And of course, uh, the obvious drivers are uh, regulation, the success that we've all witnessed with technology in other mature industries and the comfort and familiarity uh, investors are with funding these unproven ideas uh, and, and the templates that have been created to facilitate investment in new ideas. And of course, with all these factors driving technology into shipping, we see participants reacting as you would expect. The large, well-established firms, be them ship owners, operators, pool managers, or what have you, that have capital to spare are not simply making investments. They are actively developing accelerators, incubators, venture capital arms, as Ryan mentioned, Maersk, for example, and working with affiliated family offices to facilitate investment uh, in technology. And of course, with, uh, with all this, well, you would say that this is clearly a game to be played by uh, people with deep resources, but that is simply not the case. The reality is that smaller and medium-sized firms can equally play a role in this tech wave and not be left behind. And this is, uh, again, just to echo a little bit what Mark said, there's strategic value in having somebody with real-time day-to-day knowledge of shipping operations, whatever they may be, participating in the development of the technology itself. The, the, the uh, determinant of success for a technology company is not simply capital. They need leadership, they need to recruit talent, they need a customer base, and they need a partner to help develop the technology with them. And so as a result, we are spending more time. We are having inbound calls from, from tech companies, okay, albeit at early stages, and as well, um, smaller, medium-sized shipping companies that don't wanna be left behind. How can they use their effectively in-kind contribution, strategic value to position themselves to take advantage of the tech wave? And that's something that we are working on currently and certainly I don't think anybody will doubt that that is a trend that is growing. Absolutely. I mean, it is, it is it, to play maybe as a, the pessimist, I'll play the pessimist now. You could say that the, the, bigger, the bigger owners uh, perhaps might be a bit, you know, uh, tentative in trying to put more money into certain technologies. It's the old, you know, uh, eight track cassette tape approach. I'm showing my age now. Um, where you don't want to back the wrong horse in terms of the technology. So uh, are you seeing some hesitation in that respect? Or, or is it more people want to try a little bit of everything or people are very open to ideas and are just waiting to kind of pounce what's the right technology, what's the right horse to back where we can buy that company or invest in that company? Correct. I think the, uh, just to say at the onset, the risk of ignoring it is greater than the risk of exploring it. You know, that is very clear. And people want to do it right. Uh, obviously, nobody has unlimited resources. And so you do want to pick the right horses. And there's an argument to be made that there's future consolidation within the technology space itself, maritime technology space itself. And so this is why the investments have not gone necessarily just directly into the early stage companies, but into the talent and skill sets drawn from the venture capital community to evaluate uh, what technology firms offer a potential path to maybe a competitive advantage or have uh, the potential to completely disrupt uh, the, the industry as a whole and can be you know, viably monetized. So yes, there is, there is hesitation, 
And some of that risk is mitigated by diversifying investments, obviously, and also having the people with, this, with the capability to evaluate uh, you know, what, what horses you should back. And some will be winners and some won't be. You know, that's uh, unfortunately the, the nature of the game. But there is clearly a comfort with taking those risks given the potential return profile, and especially with these compounding factors of environmental regulation. And we'll definitely come on to the, the ESG part of it uh, later on in this hour. But it is exciting to see, you know, the, the, the shipping world, which is traditionally conservative and a little bit old school, I think we can all agree, you know, mixing in with the kind of venture capital uh, kind of R&D world and, and getting some of the, those interactions going. But turning back to fleet sales for a second, um, uh, I'll turn to Christina now. I mean, the traditional wisdom is that where possible, if you're purchasing a vessel or even a fleet of vessels, that you try and buy the ships uh, under an MOA rather than buying the company structure solely to avoid all the liabilities that would come with the company itself. So uh, this being so, what other reasons might there be to structure a fleet sale more like a traditional M&A transaction where you take the companies and give warranties and indemnities in the, in the, in the usual M&A course? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, I, think, I think it's interesting to hear some of the trends that are developing um, as we're talking today. Um, so some of, the, some, of the, some of the trends that we're seeing in terms of consolidation in the market, integration, um, investment, ESG, I think these are sort of lending themselves more to transfers of um, operational businesses rather than transferring individual assets through, um, through sort of fleet MOAs. Because when you are um, uh, approaching a, a corporate sale, a corporate M&A transaction, obviously you are taking with you more than just the individual assets. You are taking the ships, but also you have the opportunity to transfer the ancillary, any ancillary services, accompanying businesses. Maybe there may be uh, shipping management within the business or uh, container leasing. You're going to be able to pick up all of these in your one transaction, and there's, uh, you know, reducing the risk of leaving behind any important um, relationship or or key asset. Um, so I think for those reasons, the the, the sort of larger transactions that we're seeing in this kind of market possibly lend themselves um, better to a corporate m a transaction i think it also is being driven by some of the participants um, that we're seeing with these kind of transactions if you've got a a seller looking to potentially um, exit from the market or um, as mark uh, mentioned earlier maybe to divest a non-core business probably suited better to a corporate m and transaction for the reasons you know, I just mentioned that you can move everything at the same time and, 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 and reduce the risk of leaving behind any key assets. Uh, so you have a sort of clean, a cleaner, an opportunity for a cleaner exit. I think it can also depend on the nature of the purchaser as well. Um, if you uh, have potentially financial investors coming in who may not um, uh, have the, uh, the, the the depth of team to, to take on and, and move forward with the shipping business, um, having the opportunity to take the key management team who may have very good experience with the underlying assets, the relationships with the banks, with the uh, you know with JV partners, um, really critical to the success of the business going forward. So, again, um, uh, the corporate M and A transactions, the corporate uh, sales probably lend themselves better to, 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 to maintaining those kind of relationships. And I think as you alluded to, Dan, in, in, you know, in the question, uh, MOAs um, obviously are sort of quite a well-trodden path um, contractually, but more limited, I think, opportunities for warranty protection in relation to what you're acquiring. Whereas I think on corporate M&A transactions, there are um, uh, probably more, more well accepted that there will be uh, warranty indemnity protection in relation to a wider category of the assets um, and opportunities for um, protection in relation to compliance, sanctions, environmental issues, which may not be covered through um, a, a typical MOA. So um, yeah, lot, lot, certainly different types of transactions, but I think in, in this market, the corporate MOA transactions, that, that, that would be what I would, I would say on that. 
Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think uh, I think that's been borne out or exactly your comments and the type of deals we've been seeing in terms of the profile and the and the buyers and the sellers. I mean, certainly the, the warranties question always becomes a difficult one. You know, if you can buy a ship with limited warranties as to condition and, and, and title, uh, and perhaps that the, the vessels in class and free from encumbrances, the kind of four standard warranties, you know, why would you want to give more? So there's always a bit of tension, but I think it, it, you would agree, Christina, that the deals that we've, we've been seeing, certainly there has been a wider range of warranties given. And I think you hit on the, on the, on the big ones, you know, environmental warranties being, being a key one uh, where, you know, especially where there's in rem claims that can follow with, uh, with the ship. Uh, the, 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 the wording in a traditional MOA is rather light. And when you're buying from a SPV, which is mostly the case, um, that warranty or that indemnity for encumbrances or claims against the ship doesn't really cut the mustard if you've got an, an, an empty SPV to claim against. Whereas in an m &A transaction, you might well have a guarantor behind the seller, but certainly you might have a substantive seller in and of itself with, uh, with a wider warranty coverage. So, um, yeah, I think the, the, the short, tell, tell me if I'm wrong here, but it seems the short answer is, horses for courses, but look at it seriously because an M&A transaction, i to sound like an infomercial here, an M&A transaction might be right for you. <laughs> um, so web webinars have their downsides, but one of the upsides is the ability for us to uh, play with all the tools that Zoom has to offer. So we're going to take a quick moment now to poll our audience. And given we have quite a cross section of the industry in attendance, hopefully uh, the results should be quite interesting. So uh, the question is, which sector of the maritime market do you see as best poised for further M&A activity, activity slash consolidation? So please uh, tick off your what you think is, is the best uh, and hopefully we can take a quick look at the results in a couple of minutes. Um, I, better, I better tick my answer. Oh, I can't vote apparently, but there we go. So here are our results. It looks like uh, the, the push, the, the big winner here is, is maritime technology, which is really interesting to see. Uh, obviously, uh, we're, we're going to talk about ESG and, and, and other issues around technology in a little while, but also uh, people seem to be very bullish on, on tankers, less so on, on gas ships. Um, and uh, luckily, there's very few pessimists in our, in our audience, only 1% of people saying none. But other than that, a reasonable spread. So it looks like uh, across the board, there is uh, opportunities available. So, I mean, my script here says interesting poll results. So I'm glad that they were interesting poll results. Otherwise that would have been awkward. Uh, but just an open question to anybody on the panel. Are you surprised by those poll results? Do they reflect what you, what you think? You know, which sectors of the shipping market do you see as the most active at the moment? Any thoughts on our poll results? Dan, I'm happy to pitch in here. Yes, um, right, please. Yeah. No, I think that was quite interesting that it was so broad and, and widespread. You know, there's, there is going to be a continued view towards consolidation, um, you know, as smaller smaller firms in whatever sector they're in, um, you know, exit the markets and the profitable players succeed primarily because they will have the access to the, to the finance um, that, that drives some of these transactions. Um, I'm surprised that ship management, because, you know, ship services generally quite, is quite a hot sector, particularly for private equity. They're often fishing around that space. So it wouldn't surprise me if there was more activity in the ship management space. Uh, offshore scored surprisingly highly there, um, which is interesting given that, the, you know, the rough time the sector's had over the past decade, probably. Um, but there's a massive amount of cheap vessels out there. Um, so, you know, if someone has appetite for the market now, now might be the right time to be entering into that market. And we're, we're certainly getting approached um, regularly in terms of restructuring activities, um, people looking to restructure their bank debts on the offshore side. Um, it could be so, possible yeah. that the, the offshore is perhaps driven by the, the kind of, what we're seeing as well is a bit of a rise in offshore wind support. 
um, that that's a big trend in the market. And indeed, the next webinar in this series will be talking about a lot about that. But perhaps that's in the back of people's minds when when they're saying offshore. I think that's exactly right. You know that those are the green shoots of the offshore market. You know to support the renewable sector, it's definitely going to be a, a big sector in the coming coming years. And Ben, do you want to weigh in? Your 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 favourite technology seems to be a. I know I'm using technology in the broadest terms, of course, but um, seem to be seem to be a favourite. Yeah, that, that's. I, I think it's it's fairly clear. You know, we we said it before precisely why. Uh, if the technology is not proven, if there are different firms pursuing the same objective in parallel, there are efficiencies from consolidation. We've seen it uh, in other industries, so it makes perfect sense. But I wouldn't just limit the. I, I wouldn't just limit views to technology as being the sole source of M and A in the future. You know, much like Ryan said. Uh, e even traditional sectors like tankers, for instance, uh, there seems to be this polarization between where the market is today and the views of where it will be in the near term. And I believe we'll, we will start to see people take positions where, you know, maybe now is the time to get out and maybe now is the time to get in. And we don't want to simply spend time, you know, buying one or two uh, assets. We want a full platform. And to, to get into this segment of, of the industry. So in addition to tech, I also think tankers has potential personally. And, and perhaps saying with you, Ben, uh, you know, obviously we've been talking about M&A and MOAs, um, but you touched on their kind of joint ventures and their strategic alliances and, and also pooling arrangements. You know, there are other structures out there. And certainly uh, when we, we surveyed out in a separate survey in our, in our ESG report, it seemed that joint ventures around propulsion technology seemed to be something that ship owners were willing to do. Now, I'd be interested to see if, if you and our other panelists are seeing trends of using these alternate types of corporate structure, JVs, pooling agreements, et cetera. Uh, are you seeing these in the market? Are people proposing them? You know, uh, perhaps you can go first and I'll, I'll throw to Johan and, and Ryan as well. Yeah, um, uh, certainly. We see all of those tradition, what I would almost call traditional uh, transaction structures. But we try not to limit ourselves to the traditional definition. So for instance, M&A or joint venture, joint venture can be pretty broad itself. Uh, and to, we try to advance the concept a little bit more to address the objectives of the parties as well as market conditions. And I can give you a, a very quick example uh, without taking up too much time. Uh, alternative lenders, direct lenders, it has, it has clearly enjoyed success in the recent past. And the audience may not be aware of this, but there are actually new entrants coming into the space regularly. And when they come into the space that is already developing uh, competition, it's a little difficult for them to build up a book of business following precisely what has already been done before by some of the, the existing names that most of us know. So they come to us and they ask, well, how can I develop business in this space? And the, the recommendation is very easy. You have to be flexible and you can be flexible with criteria of vessels you can be flexible with the age profile and the counterparties you you deal with but increasingly we have been re making recommendations and working with parties to start to blur the line between traditional lender and equity provider and potentially and it's not for everybody these structures are not for everybody but for those that are flexible but have these hurdle rates they have to achieve. We have been working on structures that, you know, potentially have more of a variable rate contingent on market conditions for a lender. And then at that point, you're less of a lender and more of a partner, while at the same time you have a, uh, an investment profile that looks a more like fixed income slash preferred equity. And so these are the types of structures which I, I would almost classify that as possibly a joint venture, although it's not the traditional, um, it's not the traditional joint venture you think of. I guess it gives a, a, an added benefit to, to the lender equity holder of a little bit more liquidity than, than, a, than an equity investment, but, but still the control, quasi control, you know, if, if only negative control, which is a bit beyond your usual loan covenants, which are kind of almost a stick to wrap over the knuckles, really it's a bit more active uh, involvement in, in the direction of the company. 
Mm -hmm. Johan, are you seeing uh, structures other than traditional kind of m a or or vessel sales uh, coming coming to the fore? Yeah, thanks, Dan. No, like Ben said, um, we've definitely seen an uptick in JV formations for um, new technology or new angles to to invest in. That's a way for the operator or the management team that has access to that product to de-risk themselves. Obviously, these are still in the early innings of what the technology, how that's going to change the shipping landscape. So you want to de-risk yourself. And there's obviously so much capital out there looking to invest in products that can transform the shipping space, the world with, with, um, with tech, especially with the ESG angle. So we've definitely seen it on the private side of things, um, especially in the fuel technology side. And even two years ago, so two years ago when people were going heavy on, on dual fuel, um, they were, you know, there was that first party that really needed to take that leap of faith and they went large and they maybe wanted to get access of capital from other providers. We've also seen it recently in the public markets with, um, with Ardmore, for example, doing that um, JV structure on the hydrogen side of things. Yeah, absolutely. That was very interesting. Hydrogen, another very hot topic at the moment. Um, but you're, I, I, I agree with your sentiments exactly that you, you need you need a bigger player to take a big move in, in some of these scenarios and and then watch the watch the market follow. Ryan, anything to add? Any other kind of structures that you're seeing? Yeah, I think I think JVs do make sense on the technological side. Just to um, reiterate Johan's comment, uh, that makes sense. Um, I suppose pools themselves are very are very structured joint venture rate relationships that seem to work pretty well but what, what i do come across quite regularly is where that where you have a longer term joint venture arrangement it's, it's really quite hard over the longer longer term to equally incentivize parties to to, to participate uh, they, they often break down and if, if both parties aren't or however many parties are involved in joint venture aren't getting their fair share of you know of the joint venture agreement they can often they can often break down and i'm sure you see that yourselves on on the legal side so that's just something to be conscious of if you are thinking about entering into joint venture arrangements you know they're all, all well and good on, on day one when you sign the agreement but then three years later when the market shifted you know the the joint venture agreement needs to shift with the market yeah, definitely. I mean, Mark, Christina and I have all been very busy with, with joint ventures. Uh, Mark, Christina, do you want to weigh in on, on some of the joint venture risks and rewards that we've seen over the last little while? I think um, I think one of the points Brian makes there is quite interesting, Dan, and it is, is absolutely right, you know, that uh, a joint venture agreement needs to be able to evolve over the life of a joint venture and what seems like a sensible if um, private equity uh, oriented waterfall at the beginning of the joint venture, if, if things change or don't go as planned over the, the initial year or two of the JV, and then the waterfall is to horribly mix metaphors is underwater, but you know is not advantageous to the non PE party, um, that can cause real structural tensions within the joint venture. So what might seem like a, a great deal for all at the beginning um, may not be a year or two down the line. So, you know, that is something to keep an eye on at, at the outset, you know, to try and build in some flexibility so that uh, the risks and rewards remain aligned throughout the life of the JV. Um, I guess uh, another thing that, you know, has kept uh, the, the three of us quite busy over the last um, uh, over the last period is on exit of a JV and those nice shiny exit uh, provisions in your joint venture agreement that all seem quite straightforward when you draft them, when you dust them down or, or even worse, a handed uh, a JV agreement that someone else has drafted um, three or four years down the line, it can then be quite problematic to work out exactly how you disentangle the JV and allow the parties to go uh, on their own separate ways. So, you know, I, I think possibly um, uh, some JV parties or parties entering into a joint venture don't spend enough time at the outset thinking about how things might go wrong or how things might go differently uh, and how they might want to exit from a less than optimal 
optimal position. Um, of course, we lawyers are always the doom mongers and always pointing out the, the potential downfalls of a of a new relationship. You know, we're like the uh, the 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 the, uh, the friend when when friends are getting married. You say, well, you know, seven out of ten marriages end in divorce, and this could happen and that could happen. We're not always the most popular people for pointing these out, but I think it is worth spending. Uh, additional time on thinking through those issues and thinking about the what ifs. Um, Zina, I know you've spent a lot of time in the last little while dealing with kind of consent issues under various joint ventures and M&A transactions. And I think uh, the, the theme there uh, seems to be, you know, cl clarity and simplicity in drafting is key. However, it needs to be accurate. And sometimes we're, we're seeing a, a lesser degree of accuracy than perhaps would be beneficial. Is, is that fair to say? Yeah, no, look, I totally agree with that. With uh, all the comments that the, the panel has made on, on joint ventures, and yeah, on the legal side, particularly uh, what Mark was saying, and, and yeah, you're absolutely right, Dan. Um, uh, simplicity in drafting is the uh, is the way forward. Um, <laughs> that, you know, clarity on on concepts, and I think um, you know uh, when we come down to our um, you know when we're concluding today's session with our you know with our top tips for successful M and A transactions and in, I'd include JVs in, in that um, you know just having your clarity of purpose and you know what you're trying to achieve when you write the words down uh, is, is a good idea. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so I'm gonna, I've, I've been teasing this the whole time uh, for some reason, um, uh, but it's just seemed to have come out as as quite a clear. Uh, topic of conversation being ESG, of course, environmental, social and governance. Uh, obviously, Watson, Farley and Williams did a uh, survey with a report very recently that was, was issued that Mark's going to tell us a little bit more about. But um, Mark, do you think ESG plays much of a role in shipping m and in, not in terms of the target, but perhaps in the actual transaction itself? And, and, and if so, is its role increasing? Um, I think I think it has to a certain extent, but I think it certainly will to a much greater extent uh, over the next period. Um, as you say, Dan, we released our report on 24th of February based on a wide ranging survey of various industry participants. And for those in the audience who haven't read the report, I do commend it to you. It's actually a, a really good read and certainly worth um, some time over a, a cup of coffee or two to, to read through it. And you know, there really were some, some clear themes that, that came through that report from respondents, which you know, the, the report itself, focusing on the, the, the environmental, social and governmental challenges faced by the maritime industry. Um, and so some of the themes that, that, that came through that are particularly relevant to our discussion today are, I think, a, a, a clear response or a clear feeling from almost all of our respondents that um, if the industry is to meet these ambitious ESG and climate change targets that are being imposed, um, it will require the implementation of, of newly developed technological solutions. Without those newly developed technological solutions, you know, the targets just won't be met. Um, but uh, alongside that, I think there was a clear feeling that there is a funding gap for research and development and implementation of that new technology that's required. You know, the traditional ship, uh, sources of shipping finance just don't have either the appetite or the ability to to finance um, the, the, the R&D and the implementation of these new technologies. So what was quite clear, I think, from our report is that new solutions are required. And, you know, it was really interesting hearing, um, you know, Ben in particular talking about, um, you know, the, the, the way that the industry is, is having to learn lessons from, from other, other industries that, that have uh, deployed and invested in new technology. And just thinking about our industry and how we go about things in a different way, because what's, what's for sure is the old ways of financing will not work for these new technological solutions that are, are, are required. I saw, a, I saw a nod there from you, Ryan. Do you agree with that? And uh, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I agree exactly what, what Mark's just uh, stated. Um, I'll just make a, qu a quick point, which which was surprising and somewhat encouraging, I think, that so some of the sort of you know, lower tier mid-market players I've been speaking to have a strong focus on ESG uh, and recognise it being an issue. And I think that's 
That's primarily because they're you know, looking to continue to build relationships with their, with their financiers, with their customers and suppliers. And you know, those are usually major, larger businesses which have a focus on this. So they, they don't want to be seen to be left behind with the major players in being able to invest and then the mid-tier smaller players uh, then having to catch up. So I, I was encouraged by that. That's good. And what about you, Johan? Are, 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 are you seeing with your contacts and clients a similar kind of tentative steps into the ESG pool or are they fully fully jumping in? Yeah, look, um, it's the three letters that we hear every day, um, <laughs> but we're definitely still in the very early innings. And, you know, I love baseball. So to, so to use my analogy is, you know, it feels like we're still in the dugout have even you know, gone on to the first inning. Um, I don't think it's a hindrance to, to M&A activity um, if you don't have an ESG angle today. Um, but of course you need a strategy and that strategy is gonna evolve because it is the focus from, from all players. So as long as you have a strategy to, to deploy, um, that's okay. Um, but I don't think it's one where if you don't check the box exactly on the, the, these you know, criteria, then that, hey, there's no M&A activity. I don't think that's the case. Yeah, right. But it's certainly got to be something that, uh, you know, owners especially, but owners of any company that needs to, uh, is looking to certainly IPO or to sell or, or what have you needs to turn a view. And I think we do a lot of, we have a lot of focus on the E at the moment because, you know, of IMO regulations and, and what have you. But the S and the G, obviously, you know, the, 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 the social part of it, caring for crew, um, really came to the fore again during the pandemic, and rightfully so. But also, really, uh, perhaps the, the the little the little sibling of the, of the three, the governance. When we get to the point two or three years down the road, and it's more developed, and we're out of the dugout, and perhaps we're in the the sixth or seventh innings. I'm showing my knowledge of baseball there, which is that's about the limit of it. Sorry, Johan. Um, that that it will be too late to put in place all of the structures that need to be put in place quickly, in order for a seller to ensure that their company is compliant. So I think even though we are in early days, it's certainly something not not just the E, which I think everyone is very aware of, but the S and the G, we, we need to start, you know, looking at a little bit more closely in, in future proofing. Um, so to end off our discussion, I'm going to ask uh, if there's any final thoughts or tips from each of our panel uh, that they want to give our audience concerning what they should be aware of before they engage in a maritime M&A process. But whilst each of our panelists think of that, I'm going to ask a second poll question. Uh, so, the second poll question is, what is the biggest challenge you have faced within your m &A activity? So that's if you've been involved as a buyer or a seller, an advisor or otherwise. Uh, what has been the part of the uh, transaction which has caused the biggest, which has been the biggest challenge? So pricing the deal, determining the deal structure, managing the due diligence process, document negotiation, managing closing practicalities, managing post-transaction integration of the acquired business, anything else, or you haven't been involved? Johan, do you want to take a bet on what the biggest one is going to be? I'm picking on you because you're on my screen at the time. That was for me, Dan. Sorry, I didn't hear you well. Yeah, what, what's uh, what's your bet on what you're saying? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, from my standpoint is pricing the deal. Um, look at shipping. The shipping is super cyclical. It changes in the heartbeat. Um, look at that. Uh, you've just proven you've just proven your worth. It, it is, uh, other than people not being involved, it is number one, um, uh, which, which, is, which is very prescient of you, very good. And I would have actually said managing the due diligence process. I can say that now because uh, I've seen the results, which is cheating. Uh, but 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 certainly I would agree. Yeah, pricing the deal is a big one. Is anyone else surprised by by that result? I mean, I, that looks unsurprising to me. Not surprised. Not surprised. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Okay, well, we've got five five minutes left, so I'll, I'll give each of you kind of 30, 30 to 40 seconds just to, to run down the line to, to kind of say, well, what if for any of our audience who are about engage, with it, which are about to engage in an M&A process or, um, or, or are currently engaged in an M&A process, you know, what, what, would, what tips would you give them uh, to think about whilst engaging in that process? Uh, I'm going to start with Ryan. 
Thanks, Dan. Um, so I think it might be common sense, but you know, preparation is key, uh, whether you're buying or, or selling a business. Um, people often underestimate the amount of management time and, and the amount of detail that often diligence providers such as you, you or I would, would go into uh, in, in a process that's a, an M&A process. Um, you know, you need to have the project managers in place to run the process. Senior management do need to commit a large portion of their time to the process. And, no, and it, it will detract them from the day-to-day -day running of the business. There's no doubt about that if it's a substantial M&A acquisition. Um, the only other point I'll make as a recommendation is perhaps you know, it's not all about price, even though it was top of our, top of our poll just then. Um, you, know, you do need to consider the, the post-sale liabilities uh, you know, in, tech, in respect of you know, warranties and, indem and indemnities. Um, so you know, it might look good to have a, have a big number you know, as, as your headline price, but then ultimately down the line, if, you, if you're then getting claims and chipped on that number in the future, uh, you'd have probably been better going for another alternative offer. Great, thanks Ryan. Mark, your, your tip. Yeah, Dan, well, I was going to say um, choose the right advisors and listen to what they tell you, uh, but I guess that would be too, uh, too trite or self-serving. So uh, I, I think actually it, it, looking or thinking about what I'd say, it's really a, um, a, a development of, of what Ryan has, has said. You know, I think it's really important not to underestimate the amount of work and management time and focus that a corporate M&A process requires. And you know, someone engaging in a new M&A process shouldn't underestimate the complexity and volume of the paperwork required to complete the deal. Um, so I'd say, you know, in terms of top tips, agree realistic timetables uh, from the outset and also commit adequate resources from day one to meeting the agreed milestones. Because I think one thing that we find is one of the biggest sources of frustration and additional deal costs comes from um, either engaging fully with the process too late so that you miss deadlines and hurry work streams at the back end of the process when they could have been completed earlier and completed better um, had they been attended to earlier in the process. But also there are some tasks that can be started too early. Uh, so for example, you know, rushing out a share purchase agreement because people like to see a document and that makes them feel like they're making progress. But before due diligence has been completed or, or, or even, you know, has, has, has been, um, you know, has been started to any great degree. So and maybe that links back to, you know, choose your right, choose the right advisors and listen to them. Um, you know, the people on the panel will all have lots and lots of experience of these sorts of deals will bear the scars of deals that haven't gone according to plan. And, um, you know, generally that experience, you know, it, experience does repeat itself. And, um, you know, it's, it's well worth listening to those sorts of hard won lessons. Fantastic. Ben, your final thoughts? Absolutely. Uh, M&A is not a walk in the park. That's clear. It, it, it does require a lot of work. And I would recommend, highly recommend that you take advantage of what's available today in terms of the ability to speak with people potentially on this panel. I am always delighted to have a conversation, uh, a, a quiet conversation about what can and cannot be done and what factors to consider because M&A may, you know, M&A may be the, the thought of the day, but perhaps a joint venture or some alternative structure would get you where you want to be with less hassle and hopefully save, save some time as well, be more efficient. So certainly I would say take advantage. These webinars are great, but there is a, a tremendous amount of complexity involved. And it's always good to know at the, at the beginning what potentially you may be getting into. And certainly people like myself, happy to have that conversation. Great, thank you, Ben. Christina? Um, yeah, I think I'd, I'd, I'd obviously echo what the other people said. I mean, I think for me, a top tip would be due diligence. Um, but in the widest sense, whether you're selling or you're buying, being clear about what you're selling or what you're buying. Um, and that's beyond just sort of looking at the documents, that's that thinking about um, uh, your tax structuring, it's thinking about, uh, you know, are the right assets in the right place? Do you need to do any sort of restructuring before you get into a sale process? Your merger control analysis, um, your consents that might be required from third parties, your partners, your charter, your lenders, 
um, and, and you know having a really good sight on on your your path to completing your transaction at an at an early stage as possible to head off any sort of timing issues or or bumps in the road down the line. So I think probably echoing what everyone else is, is saying that 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 diligence on your process as early as possible. Great, thank you. And finally, Johan. Thanks, Dan. I'll, I'll be quick. Um, I always say time is the enemy of all deals. So if you have momentum, capitalize on it. If you're merging with a public entity, share prices can change in a heartbeat. If you're doing a private to private transaction and you need financing to close, that can also change in a heartbeat. So of course, due diligence and all paperwork are very, very important and take time. But if you do have momentum, capitalize on it. Excellent. Thank you for that, everyone. So thank you very much to our uh, panel for joining us. And thank you even more so to our audience for joining us today. Each of you that have attended will receive a follow up email, which will include a short feedback survey. And your feedback is very important to us to ensure we're delivering the events and information that's relevant and engaging to you. If you dialed into the webinar, please email events at www.com so we know you're attended and you can receive that email. Finally, episode two of our Maritime webinar series will take place on Tuesday, the 11th of May, and an invitation will be sent to you this week. And that will be covering offshore wind energy and the impact on the maritime industry, another hot button topic. But until then, thank you very much again for joining us and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Goodbye.